Let's start with prayer. Father, thank you so much for Habakkuk, for uh, laughter and donuts and just a lot of friends. We just pray that you be with me as we go through this material. And again, Lord, help us to see uh, and, and um, come to the same conclusion that Habakkuk comes to at the end. In your son's name, amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to rip through this thing in at the end of the year, at the end of the hour, so we're done, regardless of where we are. So, all right, the outline of Habakkuk is nice in the sense that it is really straightforward. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we, have, we have the introductory verse, and then Habakkuk basically has kind of his uh, complaint. Uh, God has a response. Habakkuk's like, "Whoa, that's not what I was expecting." God has a second response, to which Habakkuk then has a psalm of praise. Um, and so a very simple back and forth, back and forth, and then a conclusion uh, to the book. So let's, as we go through these various bits and pieces, can I have somebody read for us uh, one, two, through four to get us started? The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, yet you do not say, Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore justice comes out perverted. Therefore justice comes out perverted. All right. So one of the words that I want to focus on this first section is actually, I think, one of the, one of the theme words of the book. Uh, it's this one up here in the Hebrew, but we would more or less kind of pronounce it, pronounce it Hamas. Have you ever heard of Hamas? <laughs> right? Not just a, a, a state-sponsored terrorist organization, right? It is, it is the uh, um, Hebrew word for violence. Now, interestingly enough, it is used a ton in this book, um, seven times. So let's take a look at a couple others. Uh, we read it in one three. Somebody look up one nine. Somebody else two eight, and somebody else two seventeen. <clears throat> Who's got one nine? I do. Go, go for it. They all come for violence. All their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. <coughs> okay. Two eight. <clears throat> Because you, because you have looted many nations, all the remainder of the peoples will loot you because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its inhabitants. That's right. And then 17, let's stay. <clears throat> the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all that dwell, dwell in them. Yeah. So we get violence, 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 violence throughout this book, which is really interesting, right? Because it's not a, this is not a long book. And of the Minor Prophets, this is the one book that uses this word more than all of them. Uh, but others do pick it up. So with somebody take a look at, we need now some Micah 6.12, Malachi 2.16, and Ezekiel 45.9. You got one? What the name? You, yeah, you raised your hand. Um, I watched my... <laughs> <laughs> well, read Micah 6.12 then. Don't move. Like, <laughs> I, know, I know. Well, you just been on the TV. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Where are you even looking for? <laughs> your rich men are full of violence, your inhabitants speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouths. Exactly right. So this is this part. And go through it one more time, just nice and slow. Your rich men uh -huh. are full of violence. Your inhabitants speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Perfect. Remember what we talked about last week when we talked about Habakkuk represents sort of the shift away from the idolatry that is most of the minor <laughs> prophets to this more pervasive issue that's been underneath the idolatry, the gross idolatry of Israel which is to sit there and say, these people do not live with justice. And again, this verb, this word, I'm sorry, it, uh, violence is going to be used again and again in this similar way. Ezekiel 45, 9, please. Sure. Uh, Thus says the Lord God, enough, you princes of Israel, put away violence and destruction and practice justice and righteousness. Very good. Stop your keep going. No, keep appropriations going. from my people, declares the Lord God. Exactly right. Who is he addressing there? 
Princess. 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 People, people in charge. Princess. Exactly right. Again, same thing we talked about. Malachi 2.16, please. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as his garment, says the Lord Almighty. Yeah, and interesting enough, one of the other translations for that is basically sit there saying that in, in divorce, he covers his garments with violence. That again, by, by acting unfaithful to his wife, that is a form of violence. Again, all of this is, this is this introduction of this idea that at some level, God is going to now try and focus on these deeper issues than just the gross idolatry that's uh, been a part of Israel over this period of time. Now, in this, uh, this next question, I want to basically look at verses 3 and 4. Sin's abounding, God seems indifferent, an idol to Habakkuk. Who does Habakkuk put the blame on? God. God. Why? <laughs> because he's not taking any action that Habakkuk thinks he should be. That's a, he's just like ignoring it. Yeah, as far as Habakkuk can tell, he ain't doing a thing, right? Just whatever he's idling around up in, in heaven doing, that's about the extent of it, right? And of course, for him, he's like, look, I can see it right in front of me, right? Honestly, this when I read through this, this reminds me uh, with my little brother, right? I, I just can remember many, many times sitting there thinking to myself that my brother is getting away with murder right in front of my eyes, right? My mom's in the kitchen, otherwise occupied, and I'm like going, of course, when I step out of line, who gets the wooden spoon? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Which is why the conclusion is the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. This, this, is, this is his attitude. And is it mature or childish? Mistaken. It's mistaken. Yes. He, he says, God's not, God, you're idle. Yeah. God says, oh, my. Well, he doesn't say it yet. <laughs> that's the next verse. <laughs> that's coming up. It's immature thinking, though. It, it, it seems to me it's a bit immature thinking, right? Because, again, he should know, is God idle? Of course, the answer is what? No. No, because we, we have plenty of songs. says, you never sleep, right? You're always watching. You know what's going on, blah, 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 right? But from, from his perspective, he's like looking at this going, this is ridiculous. But don't we do that? I mean, oh, that's what I'm going to say. I, so I, no, I, I wasn't just four when I did it, you know? I know where you're going, yeah. <laughs> So, so keep going, right? We. Why do you feel like we do this? Oh, because look around us. I mean, we we uh, have a society that we believe is, you know, calling good and evil, and evil good. That's exactly right. I mean, if I speak out against you, or you do, or you stand for your faith. You're a, a bigoted, hateful person. Yeah. So if God doesn't enforce justice, then the world will enforce this wacky form of justice. Again, the, the conclusion still coming out. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. Exactly. So let me ask you this question. What do you think Habakkuk hoped to hear? I'll, I'll quit lounging about. <laughs> okay. He was right. That Habakkuk was right. Yeah. Okay. What else? Be more practical. He's looking for justice. He's looking for justice. What, what, what form would justice take? Take out the bad guy. Okay, how would how would God take out the bad guys? Remember, God works through agency. That's my only clue. Let's we'll see if you guys get it. God works through agency. How's God going to solve the problems? He's going to do what? He will raise up a a prophet, right? Who's going to go off, or a judge, or a powerful king? Perhaps he's hoping the Spirit of God will do what? Sweep through, create a revival? Think about that, right? Because he, this is, he, why would he think those thoughts? It's already been promised. Before. Exactly right. It's already been promised. Right? At the end of the day, all of those things have been promised before we get to Habakkuk. And Habakkuk's probably going, in my mind, I think Habakkuk's in there thing now, now, Remember how long? Now? Do we get that prophet you promised? Do we get that king you told us about? You going to pour out your spirit, like you said to Joel? What does he get instead? Babylonians. Babylonians, right? <laughs> Again, to Scott's point, do we say this same thing? I know. I'm... I'm we, because why I'm frustrated with what I see in the world is because I know God has promised me what? 
second coming? Some, a second coming. Mm. Something better. Mm. <laughs> right? It's going to be different when he shows up. From my perspective, when he shows up, it's going to be better. Right? And so again, this is the thing. I think Habakkuk in his mind is not thinking clearly what God is going to say. Uh, somebody read 5 through 7. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not have believed if I told you. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, to, wit, to, mar to march through the breadth of the earth, to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their, in their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Yep, that is not what Habakkuk was hoping to hear. <laughs> He's like, what in the wide world of sports? I've got Ezekiel if you want. Oh, you do? Okay, actually, I'm going to do parts of Ezekiel, so if you don't, I will tell you which part. Oh, you okay. got, you got, you'll, just those verses? Perfect. Yep. Okay, great, excellent. We'll get to that in just a second. So, so, again, we know that God has not been idle. God has been working on a plan. We talked about this last time when we asked, who are the Chaldeans? When did we first hear about them? All the way back to Abraham. But more importantly, the Chaldeans acting as a invading force goes back to what book? Isaiah, right? So this has been in the, been in the works for a little bit of uh, uh, time here, right? So again, the, the astonishing thing about this is what? Not that God is going to deal with uh, Judah's problem, but the fact that he's going to use the Babylonians who he describes as bitter, impetuous, fierce, terrifying, bent on violence. And who is behind them? God himself. God is the motive force behind the Babylonians, right? So, for me, it reminds me of a couple of different things. So let's read the Ezekiel the first. Just the, now again, all of 26 is worth reading, but we're just going to bounce into these few verses real quick here. So just two and three. Is two and three, and then seven through 14. Okay. Son of man, because Tyre has said concerning Jerusalem, Aha, the gateway of the peoples is broken. It is open to you. <laughs> I shall be filled now that she is laid waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. Okay, so think about it. I will bring up many nations against you, sea against the waves. Same language that we're hearing here. And then we get this description of what's going to happen when Babylon shows up at Tyre. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings with horses, chariots, cavalry, and a great army. He will slay your daughters on the mainland with the sword, and he will make siege walls against you, cast up a mound against you, and raise up a large shield against you. And the blow of his battering rams he will direct against your walls, and with his axes he will break down your towers. Because of the multitude of his horses, the dust raised by them will cover you. Your walls will shake at the noise of cavalry and wagons and chariots, when he enters your gates, as men enter a city that is breached. With the hoofs of his horses, he will trample all your streets. He will slay your people with a sword, and your strong pillars will come down to the ground. Also, they will make a spoil of your riches and the prey of your merchandise. Break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses, and throw your stones and your timbers and your debris into the water. So I will silence the sound of your songs, and the sound of your harps will be heard no more. And I will make you a bare rock. You will be a place for the spreading of nets. You will be built no more, for I, the Lord, have spoken, declares the Lord God. Exactly. It's an image, right? Is Tyre a better city in the sense of uh, its wealth, its power, etc., etc., than Jerusalem at this time? The answer is yes, right? Um, doesn't have a chance. And again, very descriptive phrase of what Nebuchadnezzar is going to go off and do to them, right? Uh, and so, again, we, we got this sort of a sense that, again, God is moving this world-beating power to, to go off and, and take care of some business for it. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I find interesting about this is, again, God can and will use anyone to accomplish his purposes. God can and will use anyone to accomplish his purposes. And it reminds me of, again, when we did the Isaiah prophecy of the rise of Cyrus... We looked at the, the phrase, my servant, that runs through chapters 40 through 48. Ten times the word my servant is used, and I would argue that eight of those ten times very clearly is Cyrus. I, argue, I think successfully the other two times were Cyrus as well, but George isn't here to read that. <laughs> <laughs> the debate. 
But the point of it is, is to sit there and say the language used of Cyrus there, Cyrus has been raised up by God to do what? If you remember, it's the same word that we're hearing here, justice. He will establish justice, which is craziness because Cyrus is the king of who? Persia. Persia, right? The Persians are not, what, when you look back through history, you don't look back and say, well, that was a righteous bunch of guys. <laughs> Right? But, but we're not righteous either. That's what we're about to find out, right? <laughs> exactly right. Skip ahead. Yeah, skip ahead. So if we read verse 7 here, it says, again, these are fierce, terrifying. Their view of justice and sovereignty stems from themselves. Isn't this the real problem? Isn't that the real problem with justice? That it comes from where? Man. Yeah, man's they decide is just. That's exactly right, right? That it, that, that it's, it that also it's, takes the glory off of God because look what we did. Okay. We, we beat them. Look, how, look where we're great and mighty on you. Well, that's certainly going to be the, the Babylonians, right? Right. <clears throat> but I'm saying just in general, too. We tend to take our victories and claim it. And then when something doesn't work out right, it's someone else's fault. It's probably God's fault. <laughs> Most, <laughs> exactly. of the time, Most of the time, right? They're, they're, they're blaming him for all the ills in the world. Exactly right. Somebody read for us Judges 21 25. Should be, it's the last verse in Judges. Everybody knows it, but somebody read it. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. <laughs> Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Does that sound familiar again? Yeah. That fits today, too. That does fit today. Well. C.S. Lewis, of Mere Christianity, wrote, The most dangerous thing you can do is to take any one impulse of your own nature and set it up as the thing you ought to follow at all costs. There is not one of them which will not make us into devils if we set it up as an absolute guide. You might think the love of humanity in general is safe, but it's not. If you leave out justice, you will find yourself breaking agreements, making evidence and trials for the sake of humanity, and in the end become a cruel and treacherous man. Again, there's no getting around the fact that we will always move against our, you know, we move against our own self-interests whenever we substitute God's ideas for our own. Verse 8, <clears throat> it says, Horses swifter than leopards, more fierce than wolves in the night. Their horsemen charge ahead, the horsemen come from distant lands, they fly like an eagle, swooping to devour, right? Now again, we're going to see more of this later. But again, I think the response uh, of, of this as we get down into verse 11 uh, will we'll start to shift a bit. So in verse 8, though, Jeremiah 5.17. It's like Bible quiz. Like, <coughs> they will devour time. your harvest and your food. They will devour your sons and your daughters. They will devour your, your flocks and your herds. They will devour your vines and your fig trees. They will demolish with the sword your fortified cities in which you trust. That's right. Same thing, same group of people. This idea that they will devour everything, right? The same language used again and again through these periods of time. Verse 11, we go on to the next one. Sister says, they will sweep by like the wind and pass through. They are guilty. Their strength is their God, right? So on the one hand, he agrees with Habakkuk that something needs to be done. And obviously we get more on this later in the second response. But... He's going to go off and threaten the Babylonians with punishment because he basically says what? At the end of the day, they will be remembered and held accountable. So when you flip over to 15 and 16, <clears throat> again, they sit there and says, their strength is their God. Look what it says in 15 and 16. The Chaldeans pull them all up with a hook, catch them in their dragnet, carry them in their fishing net. That is why they are glad and rejoice. That is why they sacrifice to their dragnet and burn incense to their fishing net. For by these things their rich portion, their their portion is rich, and their food is plentiful. But I think this is back more to what Karen was talking about. Again, this idea to sit there and say that in their own strength, they revel. Right? If might is right for the Babylonians, might has become divine. Okay? And literally. From, from our perspective, we would actually go off and say that because they have a divine influence behind them. Somebody who's clearing the path, making a way for them. Again, much like Isaiah would sit there and say, it's true of Cyrus. I am cleaning out everything in front of him so he can do what? He's a free chance, free opportunity to do what I expect him to do for me. 
right? God is, God, God is the divine force behind this to make sure that it's going to play out right. Now again, at the end of the story, is justice going to be served all the way around? Yes. Is Israel going to be punished? Judah going to be punished for its sins? Yes. What's going to happen to Babylonia? <laughs> Same thing. Interestingly enough, right? All right, moving on to the next section. So, when you hear this, and you're uh, Habakkuk, you're probably sitting back on your feet, going heels going, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Not exactly what I was hoping for. In verse 12, his, he starts off with the question, Are you not from eternity, Yahweh, my God? What's the expected answer there? Yes. I mean, it's more a statement than a question, but it's in the form of a question, right? And again, I like, uh, uh, you know, him basically sitting there. It's basically, how can you use such nasty people to correct our problems? Right? It's sort of just this immediate opening right there. Um, now, later on in this thing, he goes off and sits there and says, uh, he, he goes, my holy one, in our, my version, I've got the CSB or HCSB, Holy One Christian, my next verse, next line says, My holy one, you will not die. Does anybody have a different translation there? We shall, we shall not die. die. That's exactly right. That's a better translation. Um, why can Habakkuk go off and say, We will not die? How can he claim this in face, in the face of what he knows or what he thinks he knows to be true about the Babylonians? He knows the promise of a remnant. Promise of a remnant, exactly right. Right? What other promises are out there? beyond the remnant. Abrahamic covenant? Uh, the Abrahamic covenant, exactly right. We have a whole host of things. The Davidic covenant, right, are out there. The, um, uh, we, the Abrahamic covenant includes this land promise, which says Israel will stretch from here to here to here to here, right? David will be the king. His kingdom will have what? No end, right? These are things that are already on the books, right? There's no debating them. And so, from his perspective, he can sit there, I think it's almost a part of where we're sitting there saying he's replying to God to sit there and say, a little bit like Moses arguing with God, uh, when God sits there and says, hey, do you see what your people are doing? I love that, right? Like, uh, like Renee saying, do you see what your kids are doing, right? <laughs> um, do you see what your people are doing? They're acting like idiots. By the way, I'm just going to wipe them out and I'm going to start over with you. Moses is like, no, 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 you can't do that. Right? That's a bad, this is a really bad idea. This is Habakkuk, I think, to some extent, basically saying to God, no, 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 you can't wipe us out. We, we, you know, yes, we're horrible individuals. We can't all die. You may want to kill us all, but we can't all die because why? All these promises are still out there, right? And in fairness to him and the people at the time, we're kind of armchair quarterbacking because we, we're post-resurrection. So we see how all those promises lead to Christ and the resurrection and our salvation and revelation. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing this more in the eyes of the Israelites as the short term. Even though they claim it's long term, they have a very limited view of what's coming. Even though it's been, it's been pointed out to them that they don't have the sight that we have. It's so much easier for us to see this. Yeah, exactly right. That's exactly right. This is why for us, I think one of the things that's hard, uh, still I think a hard thing about this, is the Babylonians run from basically cover to cover in the Bible, right? You've got the Tower of Babel and blah, blah, blah in Genesis. You end with Babel, Babylon as a spiritual uh, you know, weirdness at the end of Revelation. It's everything. Babylon is everything to the book. This, this is really why it's important to study eschatology and understand that a lot of this stuff is still future. All millennials tend to throw all this out. This is all just historical whatever. And without the uh, promises going forward, there's no hope for us. Yeah, so, exactly. that's exactly right. Thomas. Yes, sir. I also think, I mean, there they ought to know, they ought to expect, I mean, as you said, in the book of Isaiah, it's already predicted that the Babylonians are going to come. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, it's built into their covenant. Mm -hmm. In Deuteronomy 28, that the judgment will be a foreign power coming in from the Exactly. And so Habakkuk's confusion 
is confusing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because it's not just it's not just that you don't have to go all the way back to Deuteronomy, which again we in our the way that we've set this up with Nahum, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk, all of these books follow the discovery of Deuteronomy. Okay, so this is within a generation, you know, within a decade, a couple of decades, right? So all of so so Deuteronomy should be fresh in their mind. But more importantly than that, what has just happened to the north of Judah? Israel's gone, right? You got Assyrians living where your brothers used to live, right? Sort of a deal, right? So you, to their point, there's no reason to be confused about this in any way, shape, or form. You don't even have to go to the Word of God. You just have to go north 30 miles. It's crazy. Um, yes? One of the things that I marked when we did this, um, studied this sometime. In Wayne, in, Wayne did it just recently. In, okay, in, in, in verse 12, um, Habakkuk calls God four different names, hmm. calling on him in different ways, you know, saying, well, why, why is this happening? You know, I yeah. thought that was interesting. Four it is interesting. Names. Including my holy one, which is a which is a single version of Elohim, which is always a plural word. In this case, it's the singular version of it. Very, actually, very unique in the Bible from that perspective. Not used very often. So yeah, a lot of a lot of opportunity for him to kind of basically go back and say, wait, 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 wait. Who are you? That's going to be the point coming up later on. We talked about that last week when we we, we covered Job. Job is a hero of the Bible because he had this encounter with the living God, right? And he becomes a hero of faith, not of understanding. This is, this is that same opportunity to sit there and say, I have to fall back on who you are, not what I understand in the situation. Okay, next question I want to bring up here. Obviously, those more righteous than they. Okay? This is, this is him, and he gets over here to basically, uh, in verse 13, he sits there and says, Why are you silent when, when, who, when one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? This is back to your point, right? Where you sit there and said, um, but I can't how did you phrase it, ma'am? Do you remember? <laughs> no. oh, okay. <laughs> that's okay. You had jumped ahead, and I liked it. That was because yeah. I was coming back. Yeah. Yeah. We are. We, we all we're sinners too. Righteous. We're all sinners too. Yeah. We're, all, yeah, yeah, exactly. we're, all, we're all sinners we're too. Not, we're not righteous. And we're not. Yeah. None of us are righteous, right? I think that was the point. None of us yeah, are righteous. None of us are right. Exactly. Right. Which is why I liked it because that's the word we're going to use here, right? But this is the thing. At the end of the day, they see themselves. He still sees himself as what? More righteous, More righteous right? Okay. Now again, this is this is the I think this is one of the common things that we see today as well, right? We talked about this a little bit last week. This, getting to heaven is not beating the bear of the devil, right? In the sense of I run faster than you, then he claims his limit and you know he's full and I make it to heaven, sort of a deal, right? And yet at the end of the day, so many people still basically sit there and say, What? Um, it's it's not fair that this person goes to heaven and I don't because why I can create this semi this this sense of comparison right I am better than this person in the sense of blah 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 right and that is not how it works right? actually in our current culture it's almost flipped now mm -hmm. it's like well why wouldn't they go to heaven look how good they are mm -hmm. look how righteous they are yeah again then, then back to our back to our good is evil evil is good mm -hmm. sort of a, a cast that we were into now right <coughs> but i want to basically pick up on this what does this sound like to you and i'm looking for biblical examples because again this is this is something i think that does pop up in the old and new testament i want two examples i want to take a look at real quick here in the old testament in the new testament does that sound like anybody they are more righteous or those who are more righteous than they this comparison of who I am versus somebody else. Pharisees? Huh? Pharisees. Pharisees, absolutely right. So in the Sermon on the Mount, you basically can go off and you get this, this idea that what? Jesus is basically sitting there saying to the people there um, in Matthew 5, 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. Because that was a comparison game back then, right? I have in the Old Testament, Judah and Tamar. Genesis 39, 26. Judah, when he is exposed, basically says what? Declares Tamar is more righteous than he is. Right? Again, we, we have these examples. They keep running through Scripture. And again, God continues to have to do what? Disabuses of it. 
What I find interesting is um, that, uh, again, after Jesus says that in the Sermon on the Mount, he jumps right into uh, the idea of expanding on what the idea of sinfulness is. Right after he says, your righteousness must succeed out of the Pharisees, what does he start off with? You've heard it said, you shall not commit murder, but I tell you. You've heard it said, you should not commit adultery, but I tell you. And he does what? He eliminates the external standards. And he sits there and says, it's a hard issue. Well, that's the same thing that actually happens with Tamar. It's the same thing I think is happening right here. God is basically going to, from this point forward, he, and when he speaks again, he's going to expand on the sinfulness of mankind. And to sit there and say, look, whoa, 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 we're going to have five woes coming up here. God is expanding on this idea of what, his, from his perspective, the sinfulness of mankind looks like. In verse 14 of Habakkuk, we got this little statement on the fishies of the sea. They were fish trappers, weren't they? No. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the Ninevites. It says, you have made mankind like the fish of the sea, like marine creatures that have no ruler. What does that sound like? Helpless as fish, Judah's people are easy prey for powerful invaders. Why? What do fish lack? Feet. 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 You're a fan of the little mermaid too. <laughs> fish lack leaders. Fish lack leaders. That's what he's. That's the part of it. They have nobody to rule over them, right? The sea creatures are on their own with no leader to guide them. We get that same phrase later on in some other places as well. <laughs> So again, the idea, um, I think it's oh, verse uh, 16, where we did that one, we talked about that one. So if you think about the um, uh, lack of leadership, uh, Christ talks about uh, in the circle, when he's uh, feeding the 5,000, he looks on the people with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. We hear the same thing in Jeremiah, this, this same idea that comes up again and again. All right. So, what's fun about this is when Habakkuk is confronted with this, he then does what? His, at, in verse 2, or, or chapter 2, verse 2, he starts off and he says what? I will stand at my guard post, station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should, re and, and what I should reply about my complaint, right? Basically, he sits there and says what? I get it. I'm going to just sit here and I'll, I'll leave this to God. Of course, God does what? Comes back and says in verse, chapter 2, verse 2, write down this vision, clearly describe it on tablets, so one may easily read it. I like this, right? Um, basically, to sit there and say the language here indicates, whoops, oh, that's, I was like, what's happening back here? The language here basically, in my mind, indicates that God doesn't mumble. He's going to speak with clarity, Right? It's not going to be open to a lot of interpretation. There's going to be forthrightness to it. Again, Habakkuk, write down the revelation, make it clear on the tablets. Make it easy enough so somebody running can go off and do what? Deliver the message. I get in my mind uh, uh, the, the silversmith running through Boston, right? You know, the British are coming, the British are coming. It's a very simple, straightforward message, right, that anybody can understand as fast as you want to go off and deliver it. And so, you know, from that point forward, right, he jumps into this. Interestingly enough, the, the writer of Hebrews, chapter 1037, picks up on this idea as well. The vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end. It will not lie. And then this is where the Hebrew writer picks it up. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. Again, there is a day when the king of kings is going to come back and he's going to rule and establish everything as it is meant to be. Habakkuk is told, like we are being told, to do what? Be faithful. Be faithful. Right? In this case, faith demonstrates itself in, in what? Patience. Holding on to this promise. 
Um, I think this section breaks down kind of very simply. We get um, uh, chapter 2, 2 and 3, and then 4 through 6a. These are kind of setting the table for the woes that are about to come, right? Um, now, the, the woes are going to be pronounced against those who pile up stolen goods, who build realms out of unjust gains, who foster carousing and drunkenness, revelry and shame, who worship what human beings make with their own hands. Now, if you go off and take a look at 4 through 6a, uh, we get some of the obvious things that we've talked about before. Chapter uh, Verse 4, look, his ego is inflated, he is without integrity, but the righteous will live by his faith. We will recover that. Talk about wine betrays, the arrogant man is never at rest, large is his appetite, leaks shield, death he's never satisfied, he gathers all nations to himself, collects all peoples for himself. There's no end to conquest, right? This is the this is the lament of Alexander the Great. He gets to the end of the road, he's got nothing left from his perspective, right? Uh, idea. Interesting too, moreover wine betrays. Does anybody remember what happened? What, what's the end of Babylon in Daniel? Belshazzar. Yeah. What's he doing? Out of the temple cups. Out of the, out of the temple, temple cups. Yeah. Exactly right. He's literally drinking wine out of the temple cups when it basically your history. And then the writing on the wall. Exactly right. I just think that's just great. I don't know that that's really meant to be there, but it's just kind of fun to report out, right? <laughs> and then in 6a, and then he goes off and he says, there's this, won't all of these take up a taunt against him with mockery and ribbles about him? Uh, Wayne basically put in put in this little section. He sits there and says, "This little this little six A is kind of an opening idea to sit there and say what, sing song rhythms that teach moral lessons. What are those things? We have little nursery rhymes that we teach our kids morality stories about, right? Humpty Dumpty, Little Boy Blue, Jack and Jill, Jack and Jill, right? The three little kittens who lost their mittens, right?" <laughs> These things are the little. Sorry. Do what? The cow jumped over the moon. It just it fit the cadence. It does exactly right, exactly right. But these are little, these little ditties, right, and stuff like this that are that are part of our 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 memory, right? And they, if you look at like the New England Primer, which was an ABC book, it was nothing but moralisms all the way through, right? So this is a very obvious way of doing some things. So he goes off and he's going to go through a handful of woes. Now again, we've seen we've seen the word woe before. Uh, obviously, Isaiah uh, uses it a bunch. We're going to take a look at uh, uh, chapter ten, no, chapter five here in, in a little bit. Um, but it's frequently used by the prophets twenty-two times in Isaiah, ten times in Jeremiah, seven times uh, in um, Ezekiel, fourteen times in the minor prophets, five of which happen right here. So again, uh, Habakkuk gets on a theme; he runs with it for quite a while. So somebody read 6b through 8 for us. Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own, for how long? And he loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise, and those awake who will make you tremble, then you will be spoiled for them. Because you have plundered many nations, and the remnant of the peoples shall plunder you for the blood of man and the violence to the earth, to the cities and all who dwell in them. Mm -hmm. So who are the creditors of Babylon in verse 7? Who are our finance people in the room? Just kidding. <laughs> Who are the creditors of Babylon in verse 7? Many nations. More importantly, let's get specific. To what nation? Who is this being addressed to? <laughs> Judah. Judah is a creditor, right? They're, who, that they've been stolen from, right? <clears throat> now again, this is, they, they plunder back. What's interesting is they plunder back materials stolen when Babylon destroyed the temple. This is in Ezra 1, 7 through 11. Actually, it's a promise that comes out of Isaiah 42, 22 through 25. So if somebody can flip over there and read this. Anybody? Got it? I got it. Got it? Let it read. Is it uh, 22 through 25? 22 through 25. <clears throat> but this is a people plundered and despoiled. All of them are trapped in caves or are hidden away in prisons. They have become a prey with none to deliver them, and spoil with none to say, give them back. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will give heed and listen to hereafter? Who gave Jacob up for spoil and Israel to plunderers? Was it not the Lord whom 
against whom we have sinned, and in those ways they were not willing to walk, and whose law they did not obey. And so he poured out on him the heat of his anger and the fierceness of battle, and it set him aflame all around. Yet he did not recognize it, and it burned him, but he paid no attention. Yeah, this is the this is this is the real reason why Habakkuk's even here. Because that section of Isaiah is about this period of time right now. Okay? And God basically saying there, guess what? These people have all been what? Captured, despoiled, you know, ripped off, etc., etc., right? And what's the interesting word is right in the middle. Who's going to say, give it back? Well, who gets back their stuff Israel. after it's been ripped off? Israel. Israel does. Yeah. It's craziness. Because why? Ezra, 7, Ezra 1, 7 through 11 talks about it. That same cup that Balshazar is drinking out of before the finger on the wall starts writing ends up back in Jerusalem. Why? Because it was God's idea. It's again, it's one of those, it's yet one of those other things where he sits there and says, Look, I will prove to you I can take care of the bigger by doing what? The lesser. Something small and trivial like just returning the instruments of the temple worship to Jerusalem means what? You can count on me for the big stuff. Woe 2, 9 through 11, the isolationists. Somebody read that for us, please, in, in Habakkuk. Woe to him who dishonestly makes wealth for his house to place his nest on high, to escape the grasp of disaster. <clears throat> who plans shame for your house by wiping out many peoples and sinning against your own self. For the stones will cry out from the wall and the rafters will enter them from the woodwork. Yeah, again. This is this idea, I love this, is to sit there and say that if every single enemy were eliminated, right? And every single you know, person was, was outraged, that was outraged over your activity, was wiped out, the very stones and the timbers of your homes would do what? Accuse you. Why? Because you stole those two. It's, it's like, it's this idea of, of uh, the um, telltale heart, right? Uh, that you, you can't look at anything around you and not realize it came from someplace else. Renee and I were, when we were in um, Venice, one of the crazy things about St. Mark's Cathedral is you can look and see all the stuff they stole from Constantinople. And you're looking at some, at some level, don't you just realize? You probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> no. It's just right there in front of them, right? So, so ultimately, what God is saying is God is always is, is the aggrieved party. He, he's the one who's been offended, right? And he is going to, his justice is for his purposes, not, not even for Judas, mm -hmm. right? It's for his name. Well, we're going to come to that in just a second. So we're going to go through the woes first, because I, I, I got three more woes I want to do, and then I want to ask that question, okay? So we have this other part of this, too, I think is interesting. Obadiah 3, 4, sits there and says, your, pres your presumptuous heart has deceived you, those who live in clefts of rock in your homes on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? And though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. Again, Obadiah, the, the prototypical minor prophet. Woe three, barbarity. Verses uh, 12 through 14, please. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. As the waters cover the sea. Exactly right. This is an interesting uh, portion. There's going to be a lot of stuff with water coming up here in a bit. We'll cover that in just a second. But if you notice, waters, seas, rivers, blah, blah, blah. Uh, get used a lot in uh, in this book. We'll talk about waters here in just a second. I would suggest, again, read through Isaiah 5, 8 through 30. Um, just, uh, uh, this is Isaiah's version of woes. There's so much material that covers over it. I'm going to read Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah 25, uh, 15 through 17. So it says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and make all the nations I'm sending to you, sending you to to drink from it. They will drink, they will stagger, they will go out of their minds because of the sword I am sending among them. So again, I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations drink of it, and everyone the Lord sent me to, right? It comes right out of this same thing here, right? 
uh, um, basically the, the idea of um, this indignity uh, that, that comes about because of the blood of, or because of the cup of God's wrath. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the next one, uh, which is actually um, uh, 18 through 20, please. Idolatry, the classic. What profit is the idol when its maker has carved it, or an image, a teacher of falsehood? For its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake, to a dumb stone, arise. And that is your teacher? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Exactly. So again, Isaiah 44, 9 through 20, classic uh, mock or sarcasm or satire of worship. And some of this, again, we won't read it, but again, just, a, just for an expansion of this whole deal. So now, to Alan's point, who are the woes directed against... What is the point of the discourse by God? He's gone through these five woes. Do all of these woes just apply to Babylon? Pretty universal. Yeah, interesting enough, right? Do the do these five woes? Let's start. Let's let's take the obverse of it. Do all five of these woes apply to Judah? Is does is Judah the people who plunder? Internally, yeah. Internally, At yes. Least. Right? We have a story, famous story of a king doing what? Well, the man and stealing his finger. So, I was actually thinking of David stealing somebody's wife. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right? No, I mean, that's, that's the thing. It wasn't a ducky. <laughs> but you're no, you're exactly right. yeah. But this this is the thing, right? And of course, this is what this is what the, Isaiah accuses of, of them of this, and we saw this again before, again and again. The princess, right? Isolationists are. Do, does Israel tend to think of themselves in those terms? Like we are untouchable. Right? Like I mean, David, I, David and Nathan and the, the, the lamb. Okay, and what is right. it? Right. In, in, in that he took the, the oh, yes, David yeah. himself took what was not his. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So plunder, they're definitely plunders. Now isolationists. Does Israel think of them terms in themselves in terms of isolationism? Yes. Why? Um, well, because they have. It's like, well, you can't touch us because we have God, and then they're just rampantly sinning. Exactly. <laughs> We're chosen. We're chosen. They just fall under that title. We're chosen, right? Um, and yet, you know, and somehow, again, for, for everybody else, they're like, well, we're physically, we have some cool place to live. They're like, well, we live in Jerusalem, around Jerusalem, we're above and beyond, blah, blah, blah. Are they barbarous people? Do they have prophets? Do they have prophets? <laughs> they kill the prophets. Exactly. Exactly right. You know, which of the prophets did die, right? I mean, did Jesus' claim is pretty you know, strong here. Do they foster indignity amongst the people? Right? Yeah. Absolutely. And do they idol worship? All the time. Yeah, that's been their big problem, right? This is the thing about this section. You want to read through it with this lens to sit there and say, this is God basically saying what? Yeah, I get it. I get it. What you're saying, Habakkuk, these are terrible people, the Babylonians. Look in the mirror. Look at exactly. <laughs> Look in the mirror. The problem is not the nation group. The problem is what? The people. Just like in the Sermon on the Mount. If you need, to, if you want to change your people, you have to change your people <laughs> from the inside out. This is when you go back to two four, right here, here in here. It says, "The righteous shall live by faith." faith. Exactly right. This is exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Excuse me if you've already discussed this. I might have missed it, but um, the way the way I've always understood Habakkuk to sort of account for this idea, especially, is that Habakkuk is speaking from the perspective of, of the believing remnant, mm -hmm. complaining about the sin of the nation around them and the sin and the judgment that's going to come on the whole nation. Yep. Right? Is it? Have you addressed that? Then? Yeah. Okay, I'm fine. That's okay. Keep yeah. it. But so, so where are you going with that? That step? You're stepping back for some reason. So, 
No, I, I was going to say that if, if, if his initial complaint, complaint was not necessarily about Babylon that's coming to judge and that they're ooh, unrighteous, and his complaint is about the nation around him and the fact that the remnant is suffering with the unbelieving nation, uh, then, then even his claim earlier in chapter 1 about uh, why must the why must uh -huh. the, the righteous suffer at the hand, you know, that's, then, then he would be correct in labeling himself as the righteous remnant. The problem is with this yeah. is that I, so yeah, so this is where I'm going with this, sure. the woes, right? This is where I think God is going with the woes. Right. Habakkuk has thrown out this idea why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? Mm -hmm. The problem with this is what? There is, this is not Sodom and Gomorrah where God pulls Lot out of sure. Sodom. The, <clears throat> the remnant here are wiped out with everybody else. Mm -hmm. The remnant are taken to Babylon along right. with everybody else, right? right? Yeah. Um, so in this case, you know, from this perspective, I think Habakkuk is basically sitting there saying, you, this is unfair. This is grossly unfair. Sure. You've acted differently in the past, God. Right. Why is it? Why this course of action? God's answer, I think, just like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, when people are basically in this comparison business, mm -hmm. is to sit there and say, Habakkuk, my friend, I'm sorry, you're just as bad as these people. Sure. You see it, but most don't. And this is why I'm going to go through this, and I want you to write this down, because why? Everybody needs to understand this. So that's where I'm going with this. And, and I think I think at the end of the day, though, as you read through this, and almost every commentator sits there and says, these five woes are directed at Babylon. I'm like, I don't agree with that. Yeah, they probably are directed at Babylon, but they're also directed at Judah. Because, unfortunately, people are people. So, yeah. Everybody good with all that? All right, great. Moving on. So... We have, as a response to all of this stuff, basically a psalm, okay? Where, where Habakkuk goes off and says, okay, I'm going to think about all this deal, and then uh, well, how do I process it? And Habakkuk's way of processing this is essentially, I guess he writes a, writes a psalm, okay? Not my way of dealing with it, but that's his way. <laughs> anyway, so we get the, kind of the opening section here in uh, you know 3, 1 through 15, the power and the person of God, right? Um, where Habakkuk is just basically going to go through, and he's going to just kind of talk about, you know, who who God is, right? And what is He like? And of course, you get some of the great things, right? The brilliance, His brilliance is like light. Rays are flashing from His hand. These are some classic, you know, uh, ideas here. But then you get some weird stuff uh, from my perspective in Revelation uh, in uh, three eight. We get that he shakes and he stands and shakes the earth. We understand that before, blah, blah, blah. But in verse 8, he says, Are you angry at the rivers, Lord? Is your wrath against the rivers? Or is your rage against the sea when you ride on your horses, your victorious chariot? What's with the water themes in 4 through 15? Again, I suggest at some point just take a look and see how many times the word waters and rivers and seas and whatnot are kind of throughout this book. Are the Israelites, or the Judites, let's put it like this, are they a big seagoing power? No. no. <laughs> Not really, right? In fact, in, from their perspective, that's why they don't care for the Philistines, because the Philistines are, and they're like, eh, the sea is deep and scary, and we're not interested. So what you're asking is, what are they trying to say? Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly right. <laughs> that was so, a good one. That was very good. <laughs> <laughs> at least we know Wendy's paying attention. Mm, yes, exactly right. You get to do it. <laughs> so, was God showing his wrath at the rivers, the streams, and the seas? In other words, is God angry with nature? How would y'all answer that question? Is that the answer given? <laughs> Is it? I would say no. <laughs> I would also say no. Okay, right. Interesting that the answer no is implied, but it is not given, right? God, I, but I would sit there and say God is not displeased with nature. Somebody uh, read Revelation 8, 7 through 13 for me. The first sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, 
And they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. A second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. The name of the star is called Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so a third of them would be darkened. And the day would not shine for a third of it in the night in the same way. Yeah. yeah. Then I looked and I heard an angel flying in mid heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Exactly right. Is God an anti environmentalist? <laughs> <laughs> no. He's not, is he? No. He's going to do all it's that. They're still going to last a thousand he years. He created it. Exactly. I mean, yeah. he owns it. He can do whatever he wants to with it, right? That, but that seems very fatalistic. Is God an anti-environmentalist? No. no. Why is he? Why, so why is he talking about here? His wrath is against the rivers. Why is he basically going to do what? Kill all the a third of the fishies in the sea? What's what's where is he going with this stuff? He's demonstrating his power, right? He's using nature just like here he used Babylon as, as an agent of his judgment. And a way to demonstrate his power. So again, go back and think through some of these things, right? God exhibited his power uh, against, for, for, uh, you know, to the Egyptians. How did he do it? Plagues, yes, but to other major sort of uh, deals, right? He turned the river Nile into what? Blood, right? Back to Revelation sort of a, a, a idea, right? How does he rescue Israel from uh, Egypt ultimately? Splits the Red Sea, right? Um, and so the idea to sit there and say, that's a big deal. And then how does he entree them into the nation? Backs the Jordan up for 30 miles, right? So God has basically done what? In the past, he's used these this idea of the rivers and the seas and whatnot, not because he's angry at them, because he's doing what? He's demonstrating, I am God. He's also saving them for time. He's saving them in those times. Yeah, in this he's case. reversing the process. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly. The process is being reversed here. But again, it's just really interesting because when you read this, you're, you're sort of struck in my mind by again and again and again this, this stuff coming up. And I just wanted to point that out and think through that. Now, well, he is doing it to save us. He is, but in this case... I mean, it, it may not seem like he is, but everything he does is for our benefit. That's even, right. Even if it doesn't seem like it to us. That's right. Exactly. We're going to get to what the we'll get to the conclusion of that here in just a little bit. But again, he's using the rivers and trees to basically say, "What I I am God. And I control everything." Well, how else is he going to demonstrate his power? Because if he does it to us, we're going to die. And so, <laughs> sort of loses not, the lesson on yeah. us, right? <laughs> <laughs> you wake you wake up in in uh, hell and you're like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> he was he was he was for real. How about that? All right. Uh, verse 16. We now move into this, this next little section. Again, so we're moving beyond who God is, right? And then it's sort of like Habakkuk just sort of stops, and he says, I heard, and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled where I stood. Now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us, right? Um, for me, this reminded me of 1 Peter 3, 16 through 19. So we got, can flip over to 1 Peter. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. I do not think that's right. I, 
didn't either, but I was reading what you printed up. Yeah. I really thought I did it right this time. <laughs> but yet, yet, there's always an error in this deal for Maybe me. Maybe second view? No, it could. I it doesn't don't, go, it doesn't go this screen. Screen. Yeah, it doesn't go that far. So that can't be it. Yeah, I got a scratch it. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I should always work in pencil. Yeah, pencil. <laughs> yeah. If, if Steve and I are teaching, we can't count on anything. So uh, there's, there's always going to be typos in here. I'll figure it out. I'll send it out later. What, yeah, I, what, what first? Like what concept was in mind? The concept that was in my mind again is to sit there and say that I have to wait. I have to be patient uh, as life is moving against me. That in that again for me, I have to. Um, I have to recognize that the sufferings that I'm putting on right now have a have the endurance of patience, and I know that's in Peter. I just don't, I obviously don't remember where. So is it Second Peter three nine six six through nine? Maybe yeah, maybe that could be it. The um, ones would make all the difference in the world. <laughs> so um, when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Yeah, I think that's closer to where I was going with this. So <laughs> the idea of sitting there saying that, again, we're, we, we need to have this sort of patient act, action with it, right? And I think, for, I, I think for Habakkuk, same thing, right? He's like, okay, I'm aware of what's happening. What's the response? It's not going to go well for Habakkuk, right? In the not going well, what is his response? Patience. Hey. Yeah. Faith. And again, as I said, we talked about what does faith look like in this case? It is patience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Which is quite a transformation from where he was in one one. One, two. Well, where he goes, how long? Yeah, exactly. I think I think it's patience plus trust. Mm -hmm. Okay. Isn't patience trust though? Mm -hmm. <coughs> patience, you could sit there and know something bad's coming and, and you're just waiting. You know, I don't know if it's a, instead of positive. Okay, I, for, I, I always take it as a positive because it's in work that on plot. A plane. You worked on a plane. Lots of stuff. That's awesome. There's different kinds of patience. Yeah. We can think of patience in the sense of long suffering, which may be the role of the flight attendant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but patience can also be to wait on the Lord, yeah. which is mm -hmm. trust. Um, so maybe it's the word and it's interpretation, translation. Yeah, it just, the word has a semantic range, you know. Yeah. I've heard that. <laughs> I think it, another key word is rejoice. Rejoice? Because once you get there, yeah, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my Savior. Okay, we're, that's where we're going next, right? So verse 18, all right? Uh, so excellent, excellent keeping us on track here and stuff like this, right? <laughs> so again, we get the same idea. I think uh, John 4.23, I'm not, I'm not trusting myself anymore, so I'm not going <laughs> to stuff up. Dang it. I really, really worked hard, I thought, this time. Oh, good. I was so excited. No mistakes this time. <laughs> anyway, I'm afraid to look. Oh, yeah, this is, this is it. Perfect. Uh, so the idea here with this is he sits there and says he rejoices, right? For me, the, the, the result of this is to say, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. However, he's coming off of this verse of before. It says, though the fig tree doesn't bud, there's no fruit on the vines, the olive crop fails, the fields produce nothing, there's no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, which is to say what? Everything that would normally lead me to feel like I have some security, some safety, some comfort, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is stripped away. What is my response? I will still rejoice. In my mind, that's exactly what Jesus is basically saying to people here in, uh, in John, to the woman at the well. An hour is coming is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Okay? This is the idea here. He is able to still worship God in spirit and in truth. Why? Because God hasn't bought him off. The problem that the original complaint in Job, which I think, again, is another, another uh, uh, 
section of the Old Testament that deals with the problem of pain and suffering, right? This is this puts the lie to the paganism of Christianity. You know, this this prosperity theology kind of stuff that we go up and hear. When everything is stripped away from me, what am I left with? The Lord, right? I live by faith. And I and I am forced to live by faith, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And that's all that's that's all I got, right? And so, you know, to, to some extent, you can read through and what Habakkuk says in 17 and 18 and sit there and say it's fatalism, but it's not. It's him recognizing that not everything is destined to be destroyed. Everything that I count precious is destined to be destroyed, right? And really, the uh, the amount of leverage the world has over me is directly proportional to how much I love the stuff that makes up my life. And if I don't love the stuff that makes up my life, then how much leverage does the world have over me? Zero. It is beautiful, isn't it, as you just look at the outline. How I kept reaching out to God in his distress and his complaint, that his conversation with God, that God brings him to the point where he praises him yep. in his trial. Exactly. So with that, how would you answer the question, what is the nature of suffering from a Christian perspective? And we have two minutes, so make it quick and pithy. <laughs> suffering is refining for the righteous, but is judgment for the wicked. I love it. The same fire that burns the wicked refines the righteous. Exactly right. Because inside the, inside the cauldron, there's both dross and gold. Exactly. I also think it's, it's how we respond to suffering. Because if you want to stand out in this world, have a different response to when everybody thinks, like right now, everybody thinks everyone's going to hell in a handbasket. And it's that we still rejoice in a God that has control in it. I question it sometimes, I still believe it. Yeah. And I think that uh, the nature of suffering is also to make us stand out because that's when we should shine exactly against right. the world that is lost in the world. I love that. I hadn't thought of that because, again, that goes back to his point. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, sir. But the idea of sinners saying he rejoices, right? Mm -hmm. If we're singing as everything is burning down around us, right? Don't, like don't we look very different? And isn't that what set apart means? Mm -hmm. It's like this illness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Yeah. Everything we do in the hands of Christian, people watch. Mm -hmm. And it's to really bring God glory. Yeah, exactly right. Did you have one last comment? Yeah, I was just going to say. Take a nice breath there. At the, at the very end of Job, uh -huh. after all of his suffering, he says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Yeah. And I think his intense suffering brings him into a very deep, close, and genuine experience, of experience with the Lord. Exactly. Or should be invaded. We have to leave. <laughs> <laughs>